Let's welcome him right in, the great Brian Baumgartner. Thank you for uh, coming on, and we appreciate you coming on the podcast, man. Thanks. Uh, I know you're a busy dude, but uh, I'm a huge fan. Thank you. Uh, I'm super, super busy, but for you, yeah, all right. I'm, I'll make the time. You are busy. That's that's the thing I wanted to uh, – I like to uh, ask, you know, learned actors like you, Bri. Um, obviously, I think most people know – or at least you got your, uh, you know, I, I would say your, not your start. You were at, you've been acting for a long time. We'll get into that. But the, you were Kevin Malone on The Office. How many seasons did you guys have? Eight? Nine. Nine. And you were a part, you were from there from the start to the very end, right? Absolutely. 200 and over 200 episodes. Yeah. Long time. Okay. So just to say it, just to ask you right off the jump, how annoying is it if people call you Kevin wherever you go? <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't get too worried about stuff. I mean, it, 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 it is who, you know, I mean, it, it's a, it's a double-edged sword, right? I mean, it's good to be known. Um, you know, sometimes you, you wish that there were, there were other things, um, and that people would allow it to move on. I, the part that's the, the biggest bummer now is I'll do some new cool project that I'm really excited about. And then someone on Twitter will say, "Oh, we're we're we saw at BB Baumgartner on this thing. That sucks. He shouldn't do anything else besides Kevin." And, and in that case, it's like, "Come on, guys, I gotta keep going. Like, <laughs> come on, there's got there's got to be something else. It's got to be something that every actor runs into at some point in their career because you. It, it's actually a, it's a compliment to you guys, and I'm sure it's hard to." Once you really get down to it, you can realize it is, but it's true when people only, we only know you from what we see on the TV and you're playing this, I don't know how you would describe him, slow, you don't, you don't speak yeah. like you do in real life and you're playing this character and we all just assume that's you. And so then someone meets you in person, like, oh, this guy can actually speak English and I, he can follow me. <laughs> and so it's like, I think it's a compliment to you guys as actors, but yeah, double-edged sword, man. So it's. Is, were you ever worried, of, like, as the show was getting season six, seven, eight, like, man, maybe I'm getting typecast a little bit? Well, I mean, you know, that for me, look, I mean, I it was such a blessing. I mean, the whole thing, I, I you know, not only – I was a huge fan of the show as well. So, I, you know, I never took that for granted. You know, I always was, you know, incredibly appreciative of what the show, you know, did for me. I, you know, I think that – that while it was going on, it wasn't so much concern. I mean, that's what I was doing. But since I've been, since it's been over, sure, it's it, it, there been a conscious decision by by me and what I work with to say, okay, we're not going to do that at, at least for a while. We're going to try to find totally new and different, uh, you know, things to do, and and then hopefully, uh, despite the Twitter comments, hopefully. <laughs> Ultimately, it will be something that people will be excited about to see me do something different. You know, that's the goal anyway. But it's it's actually been a fun, you know, year since the show's been done and being able to do different things. It's been fun. I was lucky enough to go out and uh, watch you guys shoot an episode. And I'll tell you what, man, I told my wife afterwards, we had our little, my daughter was two months old. We brought her to set, three months maybe at the time. We I brought heard. her, bring her to set. And we were so juiced. I mean, we're like, oh, this is going to be amazing. Because my wife and I have seen every episode multiple times. And we're sitting there watching, like, on the watching on the screen behind, you know, right right behind your soundstage, whatever you guys want to call it. And I'm thinking, like, these every single one of these guys in there are absolute geniuses. And I was like, we left after half a day, barely. And I was like, I'm exhausted for these people, you know. We just see you, you guys re supposedly playing characters and reading lines. But you guys – work at it man is that one of the things is that like a misconception you think about actors that you just like show up and basically just read lines and go home and collect huge checks <laughs> yeah well i think i mean i think that there are different kinds of actors right i mean there are people that are they basically are who they are and they show up and it's more personalities you know is how i would describe it as opposed to actors but i think you know you hear stories about that and it's amazing. It's kind of like, I'm sure what you run into people giving you advice uh, on the football field and, and really, you know, giving you specific advice about your technique. 
with, with, with the assumption, of course, that they could do it equally as well. I mean, it's sort of a similar thing, right? I mean, they, you see on the screen, everybody thinks that they can do it. And I think that, you know, one of the things that made, you know, The Office successful was you know, we had trained people from a, a variety of different, actually, sort of artistic avenues. So, like, you know, like a bad example, but, you know, Rain Wilson and myself, we sort of came from straight theater. And Angela Kinsey and, and Steve Carell and uh, Oscar Nunez, they sort of came from improv. So, you know, they had done all of their studying there. And then you have, like, Craig Robinson and B.J. Novak. You know, those guys really came from, uh, from stand-up. And so it was sort of like all, everyone's different history, everyone's past, all of the training, having us sort of all come together in that, what you saw, that sort of small set all together all the time, I think is what brought out everybody wanting to, you know, to up their game and, and, and stay, you know, try to say something funny, I guess. Do you think that was a big part of the success of the show that, when you guys started, you know, season one, I guess there was no huge bona fide stars really on the cast. Oh, I think I think that was a huge part of it. The woman who played, I mean, there were was a wide variety of, of histories, too. But as you said, like no one had real success. I mean, Rain Wilson had done extended guest star spot on Six Feet Under and Steve Carell had. Uh, you know, he'd been on The Daily Show, but that was really way before The Daily Show was cool and what it is now. I mean, I was pretty early. Um, and uh, uh, and that, I mean, you know, everybody was working. The the story that I, Melora Hardin, the one, woman who played Jan, I, she had been on 14 pilots. So 14 times she thought, oh, this is going to be my show. This is going to be the series. And none of them went until The Office. So, I mean, you're talking about a lot of people who had worked, you know, in small theaters and and improv venues and so forth. And, and so I think that, you know, and in general, everyone, I mean, Krasinski was young-ish, um, but everyone, you know, was sort of established and had worked a long time. And so it really made people appreciate it and, and certainly not take it for granted and, and want to continue to work hard. That has to be, I think, what would keep a show like that going. Because you see shows that obviously don't make it nine seasons like you do. Very few go that long. But to have that chemistry and to not kind of pull apart from within, I think, would have to uh, be a thing that would just – were you guys – did you see that as everybody's kind of star grew and the show became more and more popular? Did you see any little bit of that, like – I don't know, not infighting, but, you know, people thinking that they were bigger than the show or bigger than they needed more lines or anything like that? You know, we were pretty good. I mean, we were pretty solid. And, you know, I think that one of the things that happened as, you know, there were just more episodes, a lot of, you know, secondary characters or whatever, you know, got more stuff to kept challenging people. Um, you know, having different storylines to get get people, you know, stuff to do. But, you know, I mean, I think that that was in, I mean, the network didn't cancel the show. I mean, we stopped after nine years because we all sort of felt like it was time. It was time as much as we loved the show. We knew that it was going to start fragmenting and people were going to leave to go and pursue and do other things. So, I mean, there were sort of two options. One is to try to end it, you know, as successful, you know, end it in the way that we wanted to end it as successfully as we could, um, or make the show like ER or something, where they, you know, George Clooney leaves and they bring in somebody else and and have the cast sort of be revolving in that way. And, and none of us wanted to see that happen on this particular show. So, I don't think it, nah, it wouldn't have worked, man. If you guys would have kept, if you try to rotate in different people, and you guys would have. I don't know. There's something about that core group you guys had that that seemed like it was like you know like a family. Like you know, people watch Friends and they said how they would they came in and negotiated their contracts together, I guess, and all got the same million dollars an episode, whatever crazy money they got. It seemed like you guys had that feel at least on screen. Even being there when I got to come to set, you felt that too. I got to just walk around, and that was a cool thing seeing like the behind the scenes stuff, just seeing 
the amount of people you guys have to keep that show running. All I could think of was I was watching, like, the catering guy. You guys had a big – I don't know if it was a special day, like a Friday. You had a big, like – I don't know. I think the guy was a Mexican restaurant, had a big food truck, and he was making food all day long. And I was like – I'm telling my wife, I'm like, Lord, can you imagine how much it costs just to have this dude here for 12 hours making food for – 80 people whatever it was and i'm like how does the show make money man you guys have so many great actors getting paid so that all that says to me was people pay a lot of money to uh, advertise when the office is playing that's for sure yeah well it's uh i mean it was i mean it was it was great and and you know like you said you know hopefully you saw it, it was special in a way i think because we we all really did get along and you know we're still friends i mean we're we actually oscar uh came uh over last sunday to watch uh, your game <laughs> really <laughs> yeah uh and angela couldn't and may see you know some weekend so yeah yeah it's cool to see man you guys did a great great job there after um going back a second how did you like did you have to audition for that part say again did you have to audition to get that role yeah I mean, I, you know, I had come from theater, so I was, uh, you know, really new to Los Angeles. In fact, I had only been in Los Angeles about four months before I met the producers and started doing that show. So, you know, I was doing regional theater, small theater, big theater all around the country and, uh, and Angeles and, and met, uh, producers, you know, thankfully, you know, shortly after and, and so, you know, my launch in Los Angeles was, was pretty quick, but there was a lot building up to it. But yeah, I mean, we all went in. I mean, it was pretty exhaustive uh, uh, in terms of the audition because they wanted people that could work with other people. And so there was a lot of improving and, and and matching people together. And it was cool. Do you know, do you uh, have any idea of who else read for the role of Kevin Malone? Yes, actually, I know so um when like brad pitt and like george clooney types ex- daniel day lewis i think is, i read that is, somewhere that is exactly like jeremy irons <laughs> brad pitt um uh, dustin hoffman steven seagal uh, i heard maybe uh, yeah steven seagal um no it was true story when steve left the show the casting director had gone in and was trying to find like artifacts from the start of the show and she kind of didn't find anything for him that was that cool but she came in and it was a piece of paper and I still have it somewhere I'm in my office it's here somewhere but it was a piece of paper with three names on it which were the last three people that they were considering for Kevin Malone and it was gosh I'm telling the story now and I don't think I've told the story before and I hope nobody else will be upset about exclusive that exclusive right here thanks Brian. exclusive exclusive. Uh, uh, exclusive from 12 years ago Ooh. um it was me and it was own street who is now uh on modern family will you repeat uh, that real quick i think you cut out who was it uh eric me eric stone street yeah. uh from modern family and jorge garcia who then went on to be on lost and oh wow yeah is now on something else that i can't remember so yeah everybody sort of found i guess the the everybody ended and it was cool that everyone ended up getting something kind of within a a really brief amount of time yeah everybody wins there those are i mean that's that says something when you're the, the final three i mean i give the casting director some credit too for bringing in three studs i mean it usually that story most of us probably wouldn't know the other two guys you know they would just be they right. could be easily going around doing theater and doing still working but not nationally known like those guys are internationally known right yeah. well congrats on on winning that job man you did a good work hey thanks you deserved it you deserved it did you, uh, you. uh just a uh a question completely that has nothing to do with you as an actor did they have to straighten your hair for that role or wait yeah, do they have to straighten it? Your hair was always straight in the show and then curly when I've seen you a million times. Yes. So they straighten it every I, day? I had to be in, like, the hair and makeup longer than some of the women. <laughs> they took, it was a, a straight iron, I think it's what it's called, like a straight iron. I guess. One of the thin, oh, you know what it is. You, you what, look it, at your uh, hair. You see it? You need 
for that. I know you're fre- you're freshly married, bro. You know that's why you got a wife. She's got to oh. try to keep you looking decent. Yeah. Well, I don't do that anymore. But they yes, they had to straight iron it and roll brush it. <laughs> it was it was pretty sexy. <laughs> that's good. I I don't know why that even crossed my mind. Why I should even notice that, but I did because then. I met you in Lake Tahoe a long time ago, years ago at uh, the uh, the golf ACC golf championship that we play in that you beat me in now. And I saw, I was like, man, what is this? I mean, I, you look the exact same, but you look so different. And I was like, I bet they straightened his hair. So they what do. a weird metrosexual thing for me to notice. Hey, whatever. 2015. I mean, yeah, whatever. Speaking of which, I'm going to. That's it's just water. If that's this a water. You get how fancy you are with that nice water. This is water. what we do in L.A. In L.A., this is how we drink our water. You drink water out of the uh, out of the wine glass, nice wine glass, and then here you go. See my water? Blue Green cup Bay. for all for the the audio strictly audio listeners. Brian held up a wine glass of water, and I have my blue cup slash. It's a red cup, but it's blue. Doesn't matter. Um. <laughs> so what are you doing now, man? What uh? I know you've, you've stayed busy. I know you're still acting. Where uh, where can people find you? Well, I uh, I just shot a movie, which is actually a very cool uh, project. With uh, The lead is Billy Joe Armstrong from Green Day. Yeah, he did. Uh, and, I know they had a Broadway deal, too. Yep. He, he uh, wrote and produced that, and uh, he's just a great guy. So I just finished shooting that, and... Um, Doing some other television, just shot a couple of things and and uh, in a couple of weeks, and you know, kind of just just trying to find a permanent job, and um, it's it's been really fun. I mean, being able to do these projects, you know, we this movie Judy Greer was in it, and Fred Armisen, and Selma Blair, and a bunch of just great great people, and just being able to do something so totally different um, with Billy Joe, it was, it was awesome. Is that something that you guys, like you and your <clears throat> agent managers, whatever, make a like a conscious decision that all right, I played this character on TV, but now you referenced it earlier, like let's get out there and try something different, like go be a, you know, look look for some scripts where I can be, you know, I can play Jeffrey Dahmer or something. Do you want to go completely yeah. the opposite way? Yes. Well, I did a serial killer on Criminal Minds in this last year. Yes. Um, uh, a bad guy on uh, Law and Order SVU, and uh, there's this. There was a show on FX, which uh, unfortunately it just got it got canceled after the last season. But I did a few episodes on called The Bridge, which was really, really fun, and you know got to play a drug addict supposedly in rehab, and it's fun. It's it's been really fun, and it'll be it'll be it'll be fun to see what you know what the sort of the next you know, the, the next major thing is. Would your goal be, do you just want to have steady work or would you re- rather get on like another successful sitcom series or like would movies, do you have any preference? You know, I love television. I, I do. I mean, I think that there is, I mean, I've been seeing a lot of the movies now that actually the, the Oscars just came out today. And um, so I've been watching a bunch of those movies sort of leading up to that and, um, there, there, there were a lot of great movies this year, but you know, television toe to toe, you know, what's happening there. There's just so many great inventive, different, you know, whether, whether, you, whether it's your cup of tea or not, like just so many great, um, challenging, you know, both on the comedy side and drama, you know, it's, it's so fun. I mean, there's so many venues now. I mean, you know, you can go super dark with HBO and Showtime and the stuff that they're doing and, you know, even with AMC and FX, I don't know if you saw that show Fargo. I thought it was, you know, exceedingly well done. And, yes. Um, it, yeah. That I think it's amazing now the the avenues you guys have to kind of put content out because it's true. There used to just be what the big three networks, whatever, big four, yep. back in the day, and that was it. And now it's like it's gone way beyond even HBO and Showtime and all that, which I think those guys are putting out the best stuff right now because the series are just awesome. I don't have to be interrupted every three and a half minutes for a commercial and they can speak like real humans. You know, they're not censored as much. So it's easier to be funny. And obviously there's ways 
if people can still be very funny without having to cuss and whatever, make perverted jokes and stuff, but, you know, the little kid in us all like to laugh at some of those. But I think it's it's like uh, the Netflix, man, is amazing. The, the Kevin Spacey deal at House of Cards, and they put it all out at once. Awesome. Genius moves, man. Like what uh, – I give the – the executives there a lot of credit because that's what people want to do man you want to sometimes you want to whatever you call it binge consuming the shows or whatever and so they're like all right here you go here's the whole season and they're finding a way to monetize it obviously and i think that's like where the future is going hopefully do you well yeah i mean i it's uh i think right now we don't know i mean the because the big four networks are still making money on advertising. Sports is a huge part of it because people still want to watch sports live. Um, there will still be sort of appointment television, I think, where people enjoy the ritual of sitting down. Though I'm with you. A lot of times and a lot of shows, you know, you just want to just hit it out. I mean, House of Cards being able to watch it over a weekend or a week or, you know, whatever, an episode or two a night is it's really fun and uh, it's going to be hard, you know, for, for them to compete. But I, I think we just don't know right now what everything is, you know, what's going to happen because, you know, the more platforms that are out there like Netflix, okay, so maybe the majority of people or a lot of people will pay eight bucks a month to get Netflix. But if you start having four, five, six of those, you know, then that then what you know then what happens? And then you're going to miss out on content. So I, I don't know. It's it's going to be interesting. But you know, Amazon already, uh, you know, Amazon just won you know two major awards at the Golden Globes, and there are a lot of people that don't even know that Amazon is producing television shows right now. Um, you know, Hulu is sort of the same way. Those are all sort of on that Netflix model. So I don't know. It'll be, it'll be interesting to see. It's kind of like the wild West right now. There's kind of no rules and everybody's trying to figure it out. It's like everybody is a, everybody's a producer. Everybody's an actor. Everybody. It's like the whole Instagram, Facebook thing. Like every, everybody's a model. Like every girl is a model now. If they take a picture of themselves on Instagram, whether they're a hundred pounds or 275 you know exactly so when do you well, where's yeah, that I mean, line could, where it's watered down or you know and there's it, it's there's a reason that so many like you said melora what jan from the office was on 14 pilots that didn't go it's because most of them some of them probably suck to be to tell you the truth right <laughs> so right. where is that line to where i don't know yeah it's a good point man i never really thought of it like that to where there's so many avenues so many places to put it but there's not enough – is there is there enough writing and talent to keep up? Well, it'll be interesting to see. I, mean, I don't know. I mean, when you, when you have people now who are stars or – I just did the quote sign. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Stars or they're, you know, celebrities or whatever. And, I mean, you know, they're being born from YouTube because they did something really profoundly stupid. And – and maybe I laughed at it, or maybe a lot of people laughed at it, but you know, it, it's it's very interesting. It's it's very interesting to see. I mean, now you can, you know, you can produce something for next to nothing and have it find eyeballs. I mean, that's always the challenge. Is you're going to get people to see it? Because uh, I could produce something really great on YouTube, and if nobody knows about it, then it, uh, it doesn't matter. I think that happens a lot. A lot of the great things that are like cult classics or I, I, I find myself doing that sometimes where I'll be explaining, say, maybe it's a show I found or a documentary. I, I'm big into documentaries. I mean, I got Apple TV, so I'm just on Netflix. I'm on iTunes trying to find the, the latest documentaries. And I'll be explaining it to somebody like my brothers or anybody. And if they're not interested in that subject, they're, they've A, never heard of it, and they don't care at all. you know. And you're sitting there, this is the greatest thing. You should see it. I, could, I can't imagine as an actor when you guys actually know like what you're looking at and you can respect a, a great job done by a, a writer or an actual actor or producer. I, I bet that's got to get frustrating sometimes when great things don't get seen. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's horrible. 
I mean, it's it's terrible, and it's it's also like you you realize when you're when you're in this business, there's there's so many things that can live or die based on not whether it's good or bad, you know, what time it's on, how, you know, how many advertising dollars are going in that direction. You know, is there a football game up against <laughs> the first episode? I mean, anything, you know, anything, you know, like that, you know, like something that debuts and it debuts opposite the final four in March or, you know, March Madness in March. It's like, oh, wait, it was on a Thursday night. Thursday nights are big television nights. Why is no one watching it? Oh, it must suck. And then it's gone. But, you know, there, there you learn that there are so many other factors that sort of play into that. Um, you know, even a show that was as successful as, as The Office, I mean, we knew where the ratings bumps and spikes and falls were going to be based on all of those things. Uh, you know, March Madness or, you know, the holiday, you know, I mean, any, you know, anything. Or what you know, is sense. is it the show that's before yours or after yours that's the most that's important? You need a good lead in, isn't that right? Um, I mean, it kind of varies. If you're typically if you're at the half hour, you need a good lead in, right? Because if somebody's watching something for an hour on another show, they're not probably going to stop halfway through. Like they're going to stick with it. So if you have two comedies that are a half hour, but yeah, any show helps you know like for a while if you were behind american idol you know that was really helpful our show for a while for yeah a i was while gonna say who who did really... they put behind you guys i'm sure they had to try to, to juice some shows up that were struggling yeah i mean early on yeah i mean i know you're trying not to be mean or whatever but it's not the, you know. well i will just say early on yes there were a number of shows where they would play the ads on nbc like the breakout comedy of the fall. And then they would move that show to another night to try to, and then it, some of them didn't work out. <laughs> do you, why do you think some of them, other than the fact that they just suck and they're not funny and the writing was bad and everything. Why do you think, what's the reason that some really good shows that are funny, you know, get canceled after eight, 10 episodes or whatever. Is it, do the executives play that bigger role or, or I should say, have you ever seen the executive or multiple guys like on purpose not advertise for a show or for whatever reason they they don't put the ad dollars in, they don't put it in the right time slot for a reason? Well, it's all subjective, right? So like what you think is funny, I mean let's just let's just, like you specifically, AJ Hawk versus a um let's say a um, 62 year old Harvard Business School graduate who's working at NBC Rockefeller Center in New York. What you specifically might find funny might be different than him. And, you know, in a, in a, and by the way, I wasn't referencing anyone specific. <laughs> That's my disclaimer about, um, but so you, you know, and so much of it also is like, what's the, what's the demographic of the of the uh, of the network i mean you you don't think about it but what what fox shows is very different than what nbc shows and it's very different from what cbs shows and and abc i mean they're all they all sort of do have an identity so that plays a part into it what shows they have you know that that pair well with other shows cuz again if they're trying to get people to be there that hour well, they want the people who would like a show in the first half hour to like the second half hour. How expensive is it? I mean, there's so many different things. And and part of it is, um, unfortunately, and, and I mean, we were, we were a huge exception eventually, but The Office was not a success starting out. And part of the reason why is, is that shows like ours um, and, and like Arrested Development, I'll mention, they're, they're, uh, they appeal to kind of the college age, younger people, people with sort of a, a sensibility that might be a little challenging, um, you know, humor wise. Some people may not get it, a little offbeat, different, not a laugh track. 
I mean, some of that stuff is changing, but you know, are those people signed up for the Nielsen ratings? I mean, you know, how do how do you account for those people watching it? And then you've got you know iTunes and you have all of these other things. It, it's very difficult. You're, I think you're right with the, when you talk about your show, The Office, that you're on. Uh, you're, I started watching maybe season two or three. I got into it from just listening to friends that had seen it. And I remember I think the first one of the first episodes I watched, I was like kind of confused, not confused. But I'm like, there's something about this, but I got to like figure it out. I feel like I had to get in and watch more just to know like the inside. It's not like there's inside jokes, but I guess you got to know how each character like interacts and everything. And it's kind of like – subtle like the the little subtle lines and different things that happen throughout the show are probably make people think almost too much you know and i hear people say a lot well i don't want to think i just want to laugh i just want to watch a light-hearted comedy that adam sandler produced you know like it's like that like i'm not trying to watch grown ups four i want to like I, I, that's why i think what makes it so funny i think and nothing against that obviously grown ups four grown ups one and two made couple hundred million dollars that's why they keep making them but i think that's is that what you were your guys writers going for that um it was like a that was like I, a 45 second question by the way so yeah, sorry about that no 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 i i think so i mean you know you're trying to make a half hour of television that is going to be satisfying in and of itself within that time frame but yeah i mean i think storylines i mean we were just laughing about something the other day is like like Michael Scott's absolutely total and complete irrational hate of Toby. <laughs> yeah. Out of control and inexplicable. And it was just like a joke that everybody thought was funny. So like if you're watching, to, to your point, if you're watching that show for the first time, <laughs> it makes no sense. Sure. Now, it doesn't really make any sense at overall, but because that becomes a pleasurable thing for the audience watching it, all it takes is just one of those moments. Now it's trying to build in those jokes are are certainly important. And is that the the writers doing like okay, how much improv were you guys, or how much leeway were you guys given to go off script and and you know take some chances and for you know in every single episode. Um, well, all of the episodes were scripted, so that they, they were all had to be written. Um, but we also were every scene we were allowed to mess around with it. So you know, I mean, what ended up in every episode is different. But you know, I mean, I, if you go to like the DVDs of of the show, like there's like 15 minutes of deleted scenes, like in every episode. I mean, all, every, all the episodes could have been like, and we actually said, you know, if, if, if it was Netflix or something like that, like probably the optimal length of, for our show was probably about 45 minutes, like including commercials, um, you know, having about 30, you know, probably 32 minutes of stuff. We would have been able to include a lot more of those sort of things, but you know, I mean, if it's a 30-minute show, you're really looking at 22 minutes of, you know, of, of, of footage, you know, per half hour. So it's hard. It's very tough. I, I got to sit with one of the girls that was a, an editor for the show, and she was – it was like – she was so awesome. I forget her name. I wish I remembered her name because I know you know everybody there. And you were close to all of them, it seemed like. Um, she was Claire like going – Scanlon. Is that her? Okay. She was going through the next episode that you guys had – or the past one you just finished that was getting ready to go out or whatever. And she was like – she's like, honestly, it's like I'm – it's like I'm – I don't think she said killing my baby. It's, it's like I'm these – she's like everything to cut anything out of these scenes. Or she's like, it's killing me. They're so funny to me. And I'm a fan and I just – I have to find a way to cut it down to what – like you said, 22 minutes. And she's she showed – you guys shot a lot of pages too, didn't you? More than most. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for each episode, and so she would show us like throughout. And she's like, "Now look, from that like three minute scene that she just showed of like when Will Ferrell, I was there when Will Ferrell was shooting when with between Will Ferrell and Michael Scott. I think she showed us the opening bar scene when they're talk, calling each other on the phone, you know, or whatever, which is just mm -hmm. genius writing, by the way. And she showed like a four minute or three minute scene that these guys just killed. And she's like, "I got to cut that down to like thirty five seconds or whatever." And I'm like, "Yeah." You guys are I'm like you're the real MVP, man. That's unbelievable. How do you do that? Yeah. 
and do you do you ever do you guys uh, i impossible. asked her i asked her i said do you guys do you ever have any uh do the actors try to like suck up to you to keep some of their lines in she's like they don't but you know it, it would be it would at least help that i would think they would want to be nice to us editors right no <laughs> it didn't happen very often but <laughs> we would definitely she was probably being kind we would definitely go by if there was an important scene from the storyline to one of us yeah there was definitely some some uh some arm twisting do you have a uh, a favorite episode or favorite scene um well my answer is i mean you know there were so many, but my stock answer is is kind of the truth. I mean, uh, the the first episode after the pilot, Diversity Day. Oh yeah. Um, it was like when we were doing that, we knew I knew if people gave the show a chance that we had the the possibility of doing something special. Um, and then the next one would be the Christmas episode, our first Christmas episode, but it was the Christmas episode in the second season with uh, the iPod and the foot bag and all of that stuff. And that was really kind of the first, like every single person had something explosively funny to do in that episode. It was just a great ensemble episode. And it was the first episode on for us on television that that eclipsed 10 million viewers it's really where the show from a critical stand or a, an audience standpoint kind of took off so it, it was sort of kismet for us in that way and then you know for me personally uh, when holly thinks that kevin is uh, <laughs> slow i mean i you know it kind of just from a just a construction of joke standpoint a joke that was set up, I guess, for four years. Like it's a, it's pretty hard to beat that. Yeah, you're right, man. That was amazing. I I wasn't I was thinking of anything any time that we got to see you playing the drums or talking about Scrantonicity was just unbelievable. When you sat there and you would know the lines, I I'm not gonna use the line because I'd butcher it, but when you were playing and um her uncle was her senile uncle was gone yeah. um right yeah and you make the announcement that he's gone and then you break right into roxanne like that the timing was so beautiful man i love i was honestly talking about that earlier today with our strength coach <laughs> about, oh, really? that, about that That's scene cool. for some reason i forget what i was talking about i don't know why oh i think because i i was saying you, you came to a game or whatever but i was actually going to talk to brian tonight and then he brought up the the scranton he's like he's a drummer right and i was wondering or do you i mean you it looked like you played the drums on the show. Are you a musician? Oh. Are those from the actual episode? Yeah, these are from the actual episode. So, no, I'm not really. <laughs> you can kind of play the drums, though, can't you? I can kind of play. I mean, after I did it so many times on the show, um, I uh, I could. I have to show you this, actually, too. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. no one has seen this because I haven't done an interview like this from my desk. No one has seen this since we finished the show. Oh, yes. You got this candy uh, jar here for everybody that isn't watching. Now, the this is the, the M&M jar. Now, let me tell you something. This yes. has not been changed since the show was done. So mm. these M&Ms <laughs> were from the show. I actually did about this not too long ago ago i mean we do have guests people that stay in the house oh no the m&ms when they came home were about up to here oh so someone who comes into the house are eating these m&ms oh so man. here's my public plea like don't do why would you do that why would you do that but i'm not going to put fresh ones in there because then i'll just eat them so why <laughs> would i do that i can't so, yeah, wait there it is we got to check in like a year and those are going to be gone. Probably six months. They'll be gone. Don't doesn't anyone, I would imagine anyone that stays at your house was a fan of the show and would kind of try to put that together. Wouldn't they? Probably, but they probably don't care or think it's actually, they probably, they probably think it's care. cool. You're right. They're probably hoping it's from like Oh three when you started. Yeah. I mean, that is pretty nasty. I'm <laughs> thinking about it now. That can't be good. Right. Well, 
I don't know. I get. I mean, it makes them a, it gives them I'm a little. Gonna. It gives them a little piece of the show. The, the show. It's like when people go and like pull grass off of Lambo or wherever from a big right. game, and they they tuck it in a Ziploc bag. It'd be like eating that. But I don't know if anyone eats that. By the way, uh, speaking of that, Charlie Sheen was at our playoff game in the front row. I don't know if you saw anything on it, and he was amazing. He like how? So he was just Charlie being Charlie. Not like I know him. I'm, I was. I like. I saw the the game ends, and he was just juiced, man. So pumped about the game. I heard he went and hung out somewhere at some local bar. I didn't. I didn't go see him, but. My buddy was sitting. My buddy and my dad were sitting like two rows behind him, and they were like, "It was unreal, man. He was just loving it, dancing, doing all the singing, doing all the Wisconsin traditions." And then I guess he went down on the field. My buddy was telling me, like, looked up to the crowd, bent down, picked up some blades of grass, and acted like he was smoking them or something to the crowd. And everyone went nuts. Went after the right after the game. Unbelievable! Yeah. I didn't hear this at all. You didn't? Yeah. I mean, I don't know about the the grass when he was fake smoking the Lambeau Field grass. I don't know if that no one knows about that. But my buddy and my buddy could have lied to me. But I, Charlie was he was feeling it, man. He was uh, he oh. seemed to be pretty excited that we got the the victory too. So I was I was excited to to see him there. But he I guess he was real gracious. My um, my dad was like I felt so bad for him, man. He was sitting like by the aisle, and he said all game people were coming down and like taking selfies with him. And he's like trying to watch the game, I guess, getting into it. And every time people would be bumping his shoulder, asking him for pictures, and he would pose with all of them. So I guess he he made a lot of people's day, and he didn't get to see many plays probably. Oh wow! Well, that's fun. That's good. You ever work with him? Surely. You ever work with him? I have not. No. Now, okay, that that'd be a good little segue into. You were speaking of earlier, I think we were talking, saying something about rehab or people going to drugs and drugs and rehab. Why is it, is it just that we're aware of it more because you guys are famous or, or why does it seem like so many people in Hollywood, in the, the business as you guys are, seem to go to rehab or have issues with drugs and alcohol? I don't know. Not you, obviously, but I'm saying you no. people around you, you've, you live there, so you've seen things probably firsthand. Yeah, I mean, I think it's probably just, you know, a power and fame thing. I mean, you know, you sort of get to the point where you think you're invincible in a way, and everybody tells you how great you are, and, you know, if you have a little bit of self-doubt or, you know, question that within your self uh, you know it probably makes for kind of a, a bad combination i don't know i mean it, you know i mean it's the same thing with and the you know the money issues there too but you know with athletes and people making such incredible amount of pain, uh, you know or issues with the painkillers and stuff like that it, you know there's just a you know unfortunately people aren't you know if they're not grounded enough in their in their life and and, and happy sort of with themselves as themselves. It, it's just a bad combination. Do you think people that are like that, um, not a hundred percent of people, but a majority of people that are those like crazy genius artists, do they have, do you think there, there's a, almost like they have to have something, some kind of deep dark secrets or something messed up to make them that brilliant? No, I mean, I mean, I think that I, I don't know. I find that like I find that difficult because I think that it means that it means that then everyone would be. And but, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, Robin Williams, um, you know, and the issues that he had and, and he and I worked together a, a few times, actually. And, License you know, wait, I saw you in that. Yeah. And uh, he. uh you know, he's just difficult all time genius, but you know, he just was never truly happy with himself. Often stems from, you know, I mean, you're, you're told you're great, but somewhere inside you, you don't believe you. So you start to compensate and, you know, in a multitude of ways, whether it's spending too much money or drugs or alcohol or, you know, Charlie, you know, women, you know, whatever it is. When that, for some reason, that, Robin Williams' death like hit everybody. I think weird and like it made everybody just sad because a lot of guys I think we see and 
you see it happen and they can kind of just go about their day. But for whatever reason with him, he was so – I was like, I, once he died, I think you realize, like, man, every – I don't remember people ever be like, oh, Robin Williams is a hack. I don't – I never liked him. Like, it never – you never really heard that. And I, for whatever reason, he was so good, man, and so awesome that it, it made me think – the whole question is like, why didn't he see that? What what made him and his brain not feel like I don't know? He never did. He I, is there something that makes like actors in that weird world you guys live in that you don't get like, especially if you're a movie actor, you don't get the instant gratification. You work for maybe a year straight. The movie got to go into editing for another year, and then it might come out a year or two later. Is there something about that you think that you need the instant gratification? I don't know. Have you seen Birdman? No, I want to bad though with Michael Keaton. Yes, I don't get screeners, Brian. I'm not. I'm not in the uh, I'm in SAG <laughs> like you. I wish. Oh, is that not out yet? It's not. Birdman, out. Oh, Birdman probably is out. I just haven't been to. I Once it comes Maybe. on, if it's streaming th- on iTunes, that's when I check them out. I just got into. I just finally saw Gone Girl, and I'm like two months behind, Brian. Oh, I see. I know you're like eight months behind. I think <laughs> Gone Girl. That's that's been out a long time. It wasn't. You know what I'm gonna tell you? The old the old douche move. It wasn't nearly as good as the book, man. Like people like to say, you know. And I didn't Did you read, read the book. No, I didn't read the book. Did you? No. Well, then how can you say that? No, I was I was playing a character there. I was acting, Brian. Um, oh. <laughs> like people, guys, guys that I know that try to act smarter than they are will tell you that the movie was not nearly as good as the book when half the time they haven't read the book, A. And B, I'm not where I, I did I've never done theater. I've never acted. Most of the guys I've been around have not. So we can't like when people try to tell me just the book is better, which I know there is certain things where the book is better. It reminds me of Major League when Willie Mays Hayes comes out and Jake Taylor's <laughs> reading Moby Dick. He goes, Oh, they made a book out of that? Thinking like obviously the awesome joke that <laughs> The movie was before right. the book, which I love. <laughs> and people don't people don't get that. It's like almost like a little subtle joke sometimes that people don't get. That's why it's beautiful. I love it. And That's awesome. I say that all the time though. When people tell me that Gone Girl or Oh, the book was so much better, man. We go. Oh, they made a book out of that. And so I don't know. I hear the book is amazing. I know that's part of the reason they made the movie for anyone that wants to kill me, but I don't care, man. Movies for me, movies. I need to. I'm like a little kid. I need to see it. I need to see it. I, I read. I, I love to read, but I need to like see the action. I need to. I don't know. It helps me. Visually. Do you, have you ever gone and like a movie's coming out and you like go to read the book first? Have you ever done that? I, um, I don't think I have. But a, actually, I got a. I'm kind of a hypocrite. I'm gonna have to go go back on what I just said. I have not seen the movie. Uh unbroken yet but i read that book like four or five years ago you know the uh yeah louis the, the story on the you know he's a track and then yeah. world war ii pow i read that book i heard a couple people tell me that the movie wasn't nearly as good as the book and they were actually like <laughs> older they were older dudes that i actually believe i guess if someone's older than me i just take them oh, okay yeah cool I, I believe you but if someone's <laughs> younger than me and tells me the book was better in the movie then i don't believe them but i heard did you have you seen that movie i have not seen that one yet have you read the book no. Okay, the book's unreal. Somehow, I think my dad turned me on to it long, man, three, four years ago, and I read it, and it's just a, oh, it's a crazy story, man. It's it's amazing, but I I think the I need to see the movie, and then I'll be the judge, and then I can come back and pull the old douche move and tell you the book was way better than the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Should I do that? I'm gonna, yeah, like I said, I don't know anything, but I. <laughs> Maybe it was just like a, if it's like an 18 or 19 year old kid, some weird hipster with cuff jeans wants to tell me that the book was better than the movie. I don't believe him. So that's just my little thing. My little rant. <laughs> my rant, Brian. My rant on artistry. Like you guys are artists. Did I, I like to ask guys on here, do you, without trying to sound too douchey, would you, I consider you what you do art and I consider you an artist. Would, would you? Yeah. Yes. Because, because to me, it's about, it's about creation. I mean, to me, and whatever the medium is, I mean, an artist, as I define it, can be, you know, anyone who is creating or, or, or innovating or attempting to innovate, um, you know, in life. So whether it's a visual artist or musician or actor or, you know, director, creator, 
Um, yeah. And I, you know, I think that some of the, the best, as I said before, you know, artistic work is going on, you know, in television right now. Uh, you know, I, I would, I, I would take, you know, the kind of challenging different stuff that's happening on television right now. I would put that up against, you know, any book or visual artist or, or, you know, movie, you know, anything that's happening right now. I just, I feel so passionately about that. When you watch like a show, a TV show, movie or whatever, are you, are you able to like remove yourself and watch it as a fan or are you, do you find yourself, yourself studying or, or I guess respecting someone for what they can do and like see the things like, man, I don't know how he pulled that scene off. Do you watch it like that or can you enjoy I, it? Uh, you know, it's such an interesting question actually, because it just happened last night because I watched Birdman last night and uh, I, I mean, I'm not going to give anything away for anyone who hasn't seen it, but what they're doing, I mean, the entire is like a one shot. Unbelievable what, what he's doing. And obviously he has edit points within there, but I mean, leading people downstairs, you know, down a flight of stairs, around a corner, out onto a theater stage, and suddenly a scene takes place for 10 minutes, and then the camera brings them back out. And the the, the energy that it creates, not having cuts and between this actor and that actor, I mean, it's all, and the camera is just moving around them. It's, it's so exciting. So, yes, I will drive my wife crazy at times and be like, that was unreal. And at times, occasionally, I will rewind, rewind, and be like, All right, "I just have to just," but but really, I try to stay in the story. I mean, I feel like I do stay in the story, but I will appreciate that or laugh at at a at an obvious mistake, like, and that doesn't mean that what I'm watching is bad. But the example I always give, because to me, it's the greatest television show office that ever existed yeah. <laughs> is uh, um, The Sopranos. And The Sopranos I thought was brilliant but one thing they did it was like a continuity person decided we don't care and if, if you're watching a glass of wine it will be full, half three quarters empty half, like in the mid every time they cut back that and the cigars. The cigars are like, rrr, rrr, oh. rrr, rrr, like as they're talking. Yeah, and once you start looking for stuff like that, it's it's hard. To... I need to go. I need to go back and watch the Sopranos now. But yeah, there's all kind of websites now. I know where they'll they'll point that out and kind of freeze frame them and show you like, what is it? Even like the weird, yeah, obviously the weird things like the Wizard of Oz. Don't they show a guy hanging in the background supposedly? And oh yeah, all yeah. those weird old school movies. Like, I'm like, I don't, have you ever, you ever put anything into that or think there's a, that's actually like a real thing? Like that someone's dead. Yeah, or that someone did that, or someone's. Have you ever seen it put into movies specifically like weird hidden things like that and then maybe have someone start the rumor to get people to go maybe make this thing a cult classic or want make them go watch it in a the theater uh, uh the wizard of oz thing I, I i actually remember what you're talking about i don't remember the resolution but yes i know for a fact that people will put saying in there as a joke or because it's meaningful for them in some way and I don't know if they're wanting people to find it, but yeah, there's, there's a, there's a, yeah, it happens a lot. Or like a little, I would, I'm sure if I was doing something, producing or directing a movie, I would put little like inside jokes in with my brothers or my buddies. Why wouldn't you? Exactly. Like, yeah, of course. It'd be great. A lot, I, a lot of the times it comes in people's names. Oh uh, yeah. So like, uh, in fact, this very quick story. It's not that hilarious, but um, Jim Halpert on The Office was named for uh, the creator, Greg Daniels' friend in, I believe, college. It might have even been before college. So at one point, Jim Halpert was going to come to set to visit. 
and tried to call his friend, Greg Daniels, the creator. And this person kept calling and leaving messages as Jim Halpert and kept getting hung up on because everyone was like, oh, okay, this is some guy like, you know, farting around or whatever. So, yes, he finally came to set and we all met Jim Halpert. And so, yeah, it was just like an ode, you know, the whole naming of him was an ode to his friend. That happens a lot. But now when now every time that guy introduces himself to somebody like, oh, Jim, how, from the really? you like the office? And, and then if he actually tells the story, well, actually, my buddy created the show. Like, it's what a weird. And now, yeah, man, he, he's made that guy's life a little different. Greg Daniels has for sure. Well, I'll tell you this. I will neither confirm nor deny whether it is a coincidence or not. But alone was an old general manager of the Los Angeles Dodgers. And I met Kevin Malone at a golf tournament. And I told him, and he, he told me that it had, it had changed his life <laughs> now. His name was Kevin Malone. Um, yeah. That probably happens more than, than we, would, we would know. I mean, not people like me that aren't out in that world and know that, yeah, why wouldn't you name your your people after that i know like vince vaughn has his dad in in um swingers and different things and scenes and almost all of his movies i think um i'm gonna i wanted to ask you make sure before we got out of here i asked you about the old um what do you think of the old sony hacking north korean situation going on oh. with the the movie the interview and i saw have you seen the interview well it's a tough one for me um, I think that anyone who is attempting to take away the ability for free speech and satire is, is wrong. And I don't think that Sony, um, uh, should, I, I think it's, a. I think it's, appalling now you know I, I what i'm hearing now is that it's wasn't north korea now i don't know I, I don't know what the truth of all of it is now and i'm probably a day or two behind um you know i uh yeah i, I think it's I, I think it's i think it's horrible yeah i'm not asking you to go out go out and trying to cut your uh sever your ties with sony man that don't do that no. i know we they they're uh I don't. I think no. they, it was. They were such a weird position to where it's like, yeah, like don't set the precedent to let these things like that happen. And then, it, it, I've heard that. I, I read that too. Now that's like they're not sure, or they're saying certain people are saying North Korea wasn't behind the hacking. And then right. if that's not the case, then what the hell happened? Who did it? What's going on? Was right. it the greatest marketing plan in the history of the world? Then, <laughs> well, <laughs> well. I mean, the dust still hasn't settled about all of that. I mean, ultimately, I think that um, you you can't you can't threaten, and I think you can't. I was very disappointed when they had initially said they weren't going to release the movie. Um, I, you know, if you if you should they have used him to begin with, I believe is a totally different conversation. But they had the right to, and they made the decision to, um, and and anybody who stands in the way of that is 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 horrible. I agree. It, have you heard any like numbers of what they've made, or if they've recouped or whatever? Because you now they put it online. Obviously, it didn't get released, and then it did get released in select theaters or whatever. And then you can go on iTunes and buy it for twelve bucks or something. Have you heard anything about okay, the you numbers? Buy it on. Can you buy it online now? Yeah, you can go online and buy it. I think they that started on Christmas Day. Even that's how I saw it. I rented it through my Apple TV, and yeah, it went through iTunes. And I don't. They you got to go through a couple more steps. It's weird, but yeah, it's it's pretty easy to get. Huh. Yeah, I um I haven't actually heard. I I I mean I know that they released it out here, but you know I mean security was horrible and um. It's a it's an unfortunate situation. It's yeah, it's terrible, man. How it how it all played. Well, I mean, ultimately, the the problem 
things got real when they started releasing emails from execs and actors back to them and like numbers of what people's salaries were. That's what they didn't want out. No one, I don't, I don't think they cared too much about their, their personal safety. They didn't want their personal information in their emails and texts being public. No, no. Which nobody wants, especially out of context. Nobody Which wants no one that. wants. Nobody wants out of context. I mean, I probably have a lot of good friends or people that I respect that in a moment in time, what I had to say about someone might not have been very nice. And I certainly wouldn't want them to hear it if they were someone that I respected or liked or worked with or whatever else. Yeah, no matter any people can try to get on their high horse and say whatever they want, but anybody, anybody in the world, if they have their emails or texts, all of them from say the last just let's just say three years made public, they would not want that, and they would, at some point when stuff is taken out of context, whether it's a joke between buddies or anything, you're not going to like it. You're it's going to make you look bad, and I go as far to argue. If you don't have a text or email that makes you look bad out of context, then you're pretty damn boring. I don't want to hang out with you anyway. Right. Like, how not fun are you? Right. Right. <laughs> like, right. Like, don't you – do you have brothers and sisters? Do you, what do you guys text back and forth? You know, like, every once in a while there's stupid inside jokes that are dumb. They don't offend anybody. They would offend just your brother or your buddy. You know, that's what you do. And so <laughs> I can't right. imagine when people want to say – I don't know, man. I I obviously assume that anything that I type or any on my phone, te- I I assume is available for anybody to grab if they want to, and they can obviously come back and get it. Look at the Aaron Hernandez deal. You start investigating him for murder, and they get get his text from the last like five years or whatever. It's unbelievable. So they can get it. They can they can get anything they want. Basically, they're pretty powerful. Yeah. So just to let the the North Korean guys, we weren't we were we weren't uh. We weren't knocking them, so don't be hacking my podcast. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> don't be don't be hacking hacking everything we, me and Brian have going, man. He's yeah. got a lot of a lot of great work to uh, to continue to do. <laughs> now that uh, syndicate, how does syndication work, man? That's that's one of my last questions. How when do you hit syndication? When's that mark? Because I know it's like a big party <laughs> mark for people that are in series. Um, you know, it typically uh, starts at a hundred episodes. So what would that be? Season what for you guys was that? Uh, I'm going to say four or five. It was weird because the first season we didn't do as many as most shows. I mean, we did a sm- very small amount the first year, but then we really made it for it later on. I mean, we ended up doing 30 after a while. Uh, I'm sorry, 30 a year, 30 shows a year after a while. So we were we were just cranking them out. So I can't remember exactly where it fell for us. Uh, us um but i think we ended up with 208 or something after nine years and that i mean that's everyone's goal isn't it as an actor when you're on a series hey let's let's get the syndication right um obviously the art it comes first but then syndication it's nice i mean uh, yeah it's it's great (laughs) I, i mean i think that the show will be on for a lot of years and and that's cool i mean it's cool i I was i'll I'll tell you this story this is not really about syndication but um my i went back to my high school and um and signed up to and this is maybe a year maybe two years ago and i go back to to show up and they have a moderator and they're asking questions. And one of the questions that they asked was a question that you asked, which I said, it's my stock answer, but it's really the truth about, you know, what my favorite episodes are important episodes. And so first thing I said was, uh, you know, about diversity day and the entire audience, like as one, like respond with an audible, like acknowledgement of what I'm talking about. And so my mind starts to get blown for a number of reasons. One is, is like that they know the episode title is kind of impressive to me, but that two, you start thinking like this, this was my high school. You're talking about freshman, sophomore, even the seniors, you know, two years ago, they're like eight when the show comes out. And, and the other kids, when Diversity Day aired, you know, are like four. So just the show sort of having that that life, like having that, 
you know, through syndication or iTunes. I mean, you know, it's all, all that's on iTunes and stuff now and, and Netflix and all of that. Um, I've found that thankfully we, you know, the show still has fans of people who are, are, you know, more my age or your age or whatever, but still like the college students and, you know, late high school students. I mean, they're watching it now on their devices and, and that's pretty cool. You guys have been off the air for what, over a year now? Yeah, about a year and a half. Was that last episode, was that like a weird emotional day? Or a whole week, I would say, probably? Yeah, I mean, it was, you know, and, and we had a couple. I mean, when Steve left was incredibly emotional for us. I mean, it, because... Oh, that was, episode was for me. Yeah. When he got, when, when they, the candles you guys lined and everything, whoa. Yeah, yeah. And it, you know, for, for what we talked about earlier and all of us sort of coming up together, achieving fame. I mean, obviously his fame is, uh, so, by the way, go see Fox, Fox catcher. If you haven't, it, he's unbelievable. Another one I need to see. And I mean, you know, he now a bona fide you know, movie star Oscar nominee as of today. Oh, there's my, get it. It's um, probably a big movie role, man. You hold on Yeah. It might have been Daniel Day Lewis, Brian. Why'd you hang up? It was very, it was very clearly a uh, a uh, automated call or something. Oh. Um, I because uh, who uses their home phone anymore? Like I don't answer. I don't. Who answers their home? Fo- I don't answer my home phone. Yeah, I don't. That was my one. home. Phone. I don't have one at the moment, but yeah. Yeah. Right. Why do you have one? No yeah. one has one. Except yeah. to get calls like that. Unless you need to fax. You're probably faxing like huge contract offer, offers and stuff from studios, though. So you need a fax line. All around the world. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, when Steve left, that was that was tough because we had all sort of grown up together. And then, um, you know, when, when we were coming down to the end, I mean, you know, in some, some points the last year, definitely like the last four weeks, it was tough. I mean, it, you know, for me, it, you know, it was it was a fourth of my life doing the show. I mean, you know, high school and college, and then added time after that. It was it's significant. Well, it's like you. How long have you been with Green Bay? Nine years, right? Nine years, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's it's a long time, and and I. It, I, I'm sure you guys, as it as it went, you respected it even more, and you realized how amazing you know this thing was that you guys created, and you all did. It was all it was your doing. Without the actors, you're not. It's not going to happen. But um, was that your? You said you got it four months. You were in LA for four months. Was that the first pilot you even shot? Yes. Wow. So are guys like are people like pissed at you like? <laughs> guys have been there for guys have been there for twenty years. I, I've been on seventy four pilots in the last three years, and none of them yeah. have gone. <laughs> yeah, I mean, everybody has their different journey. I mean, you know, like I said, it wasn't like I, you know, it wasn't like I graduated from school and then it was four months later. You know, people have different paths, and you know, my path was just not in Los Angeles. It was, you know, out traveling around doing theater. Like I said, some small, some big, and. Um, it was, uh, it was quick once I got to LA, but, but I definitely, what do they say? Paid, paid my dues, you know? Well, you were, I mean, if you're doing theater, I'm sure people would say that's like the epitome of acting. Is that what, do you know, like when you were young, like theater was what you wanted to do? Yes. And so you do, when you're doing theater, is there a, I would say, do people in Hollywood, look at people that have a theater background as like, are you looked at differently than say somebody that has a, like an improv background, like a groundlings person or, you know, one of those second city. Um, I, I think it's all about the work and it's all about the role. I mean, you know, if you look at a role, there's the role will be different. But there, there's so many talented people. There's any number of people might be able to do a particular role. And a lot of it just, you know, it comes down to chemistry. Yeah, I mean, background doesn't doesn't hurt. But when it comes down to it, like no one's going to no one's going to say, oh, he did theater. He can definitely do this. I would say that that 
once you, I would say that you're way more than theater. You have an advantage because of how quickly film happens. It seems like it takes a long time, but from casting to starting to shoot a movie, like things are quick. Having experience doing the work is way more valuable. And I know this sounds dumb, but like, and not that anyone's watching this because no. they are going to do it. My but, brother, Ryan, my brother, Ryan, and my dad, the one. But like, what, knowing where, like, how to mark, knowing, you know, showing up on time and where the camera is and what that means. I mean, all of that experience type stuff, you know, in the real world is way more valuable than theater even. Like, yeah, it's probably the things like that someone watching would take for granted that you just know, you guys know like where you're looking, what camera they can give you. You guys have a little slang for, and you, you can almost communicate without even speaking and you know where to hit and, and stuff like that. I would know. And you, you see that very, uh, very quickly when you see like an athlete or somebody that's not an actor, go try to guest star do like a a role or play something even although i'm not saying aaron aaron rogers had a had a nice little uh segment on on the office and he did well i I give aaron credit i know he wanted to do well and he and he worked at it he he prepared but you can usually see like when a guy thinks well i could do that what are you talking about and they get out there like man you look terrible usually you see it in commercials actually yeah 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 real quickly you can see that this guy Oh, I'm just speaking, right? No, you're not, man. You look, you're <laughs> terrible. <laughs> so I see that. I see that all the time. So you guys don't get the credit you deserve because of what you make it look easy. You make it look like you're just having a conversation with the guy in front of you. And I, you're not. You're definitely not. Is that Does it ever feel like that? Or is that the goal, the ultimate goal, to feel like you're just kind of hanging out and cameras just happen to be shooting? Sure. But, but it's all the preparation that leads up to it enables that to be felt because it and and that's you know like i said like that's where the experience like like really helps but like you know i mean who's not going to get nervous with with a a camera and like eight people like two feet away you know sometimes the cameras are really close and they're like everyone's standing right there and you're trying to figure like what was my, my line or whatever so sort of getting over that stuff having that having that ease really enables you then to sort of put it all aside, like go, okay, I understand what's going on. I mean, it's just like you guys. I mean, you know, being in the right formation, being in the right place when you need to be, then you got to make the play, right? But there's a certain amount of like, oh, I need to be here, 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 and then here based on this and that and the other thing. And then you have to actually do it, right? <laughs> like, like, so it's sort of, in, in that way, it's sort of the same. It does seem that how you how you explained it does kind of parallel. I, I think probably a lot of jobs are that we could parallel with it. But yeah, you need to do the hours and hours and days and years of preparation so that when you get in the moment, it's just it's instincts that take over. And like you said, you make the play or you you know you run a scene and and you don't flub your lines a million times because you have guys on on schedule you got people mm-hmm. that got to be off work by five because they got to pay overtime and things like that man i know there's a million people there's a money guy always on set too that's keeping you guys on track i've yeah. learned that one too uh my last just the last question i gotta ask you before i'm gonna let you roll after you've been so generous with your time um a guy that i've always had a ton of respect for as an actor and sadly is gone now uh philip seymour hoffman i feel like he's a guy that did super dramatic roles and serious and then he goes and plays sandy lyle uh with ben stiller and was unbelievably funny and still is quoted daily by people around me and myself is how difficult is that because i don't see that happening a lot where guys can do that jump back and forth well i mean that for me for example i mean that would be the goal to just find that it's not about whether it's drama or comedy or this or that, but it's just what is the role and is it interesting? Would it be fun? Would it be funny? Would it be interesting? And, and, and to be able to do, I mean, that's the dream, right? To be able to do all different kinds of stuff. It's, you know, would be exciting for me, you know, hopefully people watching. And uh, it's, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, he, he was a, a fantastic actor. And again, 
gone uh, too soon. But uh, but yeah, I think his his career is 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 exactly what I would want. Well, that's a great uh, great guy to to uh, model your career after, man. I th- I think uh, you're still so young, so. I'm looking forward to everything you have coming out in the future. I'm sure you have multiple things in the can, as they say in your business, that are going to uh, be coming out over the next year or two. But we're we're uh, we're excited to see where your career takes you, man. It's gonna be it's gonna be fun to watch you, and um, I'm a huge fan. Always been a huge fan of you. Hopefully, see you out in Tahoe this year. I'm sure you'll you'll be beating me again. <laughs> uh, unfortunately for my for my golf game but man thanks so much you're uh you're awesome people are gonna love you and i uh i've uh always had a ton of respect for you and and what you do and really really a, a monstrous fan man so i i see the work you've put in all those years brian oh well thanks so much aj i really appreciate it and uh you know i'm really i'm happy for you and your success and and good luck this weekend appreciate it man thanks a lot brian ba- i'll see you i'll see you in two weeks yes sir brian baumgartner ladies and gentlemen thanks brian Thanks. Thank you for joining in. Please visit thehotcast.com where you can discover the next guest, get a little more information about why this exists, watch past episodes, or link over to iTunes and tell some friends too so we can all hear more great stories together.